I've done a ton of reviews of games from that ill-fated era when CD-ROMs were new and chock full of crappy full motion video, and there's been a lot of reviews with good reason. Almost all of those games were disastrously and hilariously bad, the extremely rare exception to that rule being the Wing Commander series, which remains to this day the greatest and most immersive space sim and interactive movie experience ever created. And after playing Wing Commander, it was pretty easy to see why most other FMV titles failed. Once you put it in, you quickly started to realize you weren't playing a very good game and you weren't watching a very good movie. By and large, those titles had no budget, no star power, silly stories, and their gameplay design was inferior, no matter how impressive seeing full motion video might have been at the time. But the Wing Commander series did everything right. It was a basic but well-told space epic that looked and felt like a classic science fiction movie. The gameplay was excellent, fast-paced, customizable to the player's comfort level, and exciting. It had an intense and memorable musical score, and best of all, it was loaded from top to bottom with an ensemble cast of recognizable A-list actors like Malcolm McDowell, John Rhys Davies, fucking Biff from Back to the Future, and you got to play as Mark fucking Hamill. That's like every kid's dream! It was one of the greatest ensemble casts in science fiction history, with two great games with plots easily adaptable to the big screen. So, when the news broke that there was going to be a Wing Commander movie, I was ecstatic! I couldn't see how they could possibly screw this- ah! saying never judge a book by its cover? Well, fuck you, because that's books, not movies, and I don't think you could have found a better poster to scare an audience away from a theater if you'd covered the entire building in a plastic sheet and set up a half-mile military perimeter warning people of an anthrax attack. I don't think I've ever seen a poster inspire less confidence in a movie than the three-headed monster of Freddie Prince Jr., Saffron Burroughs, and the crown fucking jewel, Matthew Lillard, the skin-peelingly annoying jackhole from Hackers. What is wrong with you? You had a group of amazing actors, titans of science fiction, two excellent scripts used in the games that I could have easily adapted to the big screen in about ten fucking minutes. Hell, you probably still had the costumes and sets from Wing Commanders 4 and 5 laying around somewhere. And instead of casting Mark Hamill, you replace everyone with the main actors from She's All That? How do you fuck that up? You replaced Luke Skywalker with fucking Fred from Scooby-Doo? Oh shit, Matthew Lillard was in that too! It's like these two chuckleheads are joined at the hip! Wing Commander- Fucking Freddy Prinze Jr. couldn't command fucking wings at a KFC! Nobody saw this piece of shit because it sucks! It sucks harder than a black hole made of sucky games! It's the singularity of suck! Do you have any idea how sad it is when the best part of this movie was the premiere trailer for Star Wars Episode One? It's amazing how pissed off I get at the DVD packaging alone. The tagline on the cover says, An action-packed thrill ride. This line is so generic it's almost invisible. It says nothing. I defy you to come up with a more forgettable box quote. For bonus points, use the words Fast, Furious, Roller Coaster, and Tour de Force. Oh, no holds barred, I forgot that one. The synopsis on the back has the balls to call this movie Starship Troopers meets Top Gun. Oh, come on now. Seriously? Shame on you. You could not have written that with a straight face. You wish you could make a movie half as awesome and gay as Top Gun. It cannot be done! And now you're making me picture a Paul Verhoeven movie with a Kenny Loggins soundtrack. Ugh. The cast bios in the liner notes are so depressing. The best actor listed here by far is Checky Cario, buried way at the bottom, only with one small problem. That's not Checky Cario! That's Jurgen Prock now! The incompetence here is stunning. Well, let's get on with it. The movie that took my favorite video game series of all time out behind a woodshed and beat it to death with a shovel... 
Wing Commander. Oh no. Are we seriously going to roll with the furry Russian hats? We're not even going to let them start with a shred of dignity? Well, the movie opens up with the base of the Terran Confederation being attacked by the Kilrathi, a warrior race of space tigers. Alright, when I actually say it out loud, it makes the whole thing seem kind of silly. But anyway, the Kilrathi bomb the station in their very loud spacecraft. Seriously, these are the loudest spacecraft I've ever heard. Sound carries better in space because there isn't any air to get in the way, you know. The Kilrathi invade the station in an attempt to capture their NAVCOM computer, which would spell the doom of the human race because it contains all of their navigational data, which would lead them straight to Earth. Destroy the NAVCOM AI. No. The Admiral attempts to activate the computer self-destruct, but it malfunctions. And apparently so does its spell check because it can't even seem to spell the word SECURITY BREACH PROPERLY. Station breach. Level 2. Oh, yeah, stand back everyone, here comes Admiral Hercules! Yeah, that did a lot of good. After the bullets failed, I thought he'd just plow right through. Anyway, the Kilrathi capture the NAVCOM, and it becomes a race while Admiral Talwin here orders the fleet to return to Earth. But they're too far out, and they won't make it before the Kilrathi do, so he orders the one carrier closer to Earth, the Tiger Claw, to go collect recon data and try to slow the enemy down. And, since I'm a huge nerd, I may be the only person alive who noticed they actually misspelled Admiral Talwin's name, Towlin. And while I'm at it, they misspelled Colonel Devereaux's name, too. I just don't get it! The director of this thing was Chris Roberts, the guy who created the Wing Commander series! He wrote this whole thing! How do you get the names of your own characters wrong? <laughs> Stupid man animal! While you were still learning to spell your name, the Kilrathi were being trained to conquer galaxies! Oh god, Turl? I thought you were dead? Ha! I'd expect such ignorance from a stupid man-animal, but no. As your chief of security, I'm provided with a number of cyclones. Cyclones? No, 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 cyclones. Cyclones. Get it? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I get it. It's just the... You see, because I'm a cyclo and a clone. A cyclone. I get it. Oh, bite me. It's fun. <laughs> Meanwhile, our heroes, Lieutenant Blair and Maniac, are headed to the Tiger Claws replacement pilots on a supply ship. Blair's a nice white bread guy descended from a group of people known as Pilgrims, and he faces endless prejudice from his peers because the Pilgrims are feared and suspected as traitors and saboteurs. You have a problem I should be aware of. Yes, ma'am, I do. I don't fly with Pilgrims. Maniac is an insufferable mugging jackass descended from a group of people known as fucking retards, and he faces endless prejudice from his peers because he's a sack-crushingly annoying shit stain on the underpants of humanity. You shut up! This is made obvious the moment we see him when the captain orders him to take an uncharted shortcut, and he immediately screws it up by going too fast. That beacon is marking a gravity well. One cubic inch of it exerts more gravitational force than the sun. Well, gee, that might have been something useful to mention to the stoner fuckhead named Maniac. But on the other hand, how the fuck did Maniac not see this? And he never thought to question the wisdom of flying directly into it at top speed? They need to activate the jump drive to escape, but conveniently their computer goes offline at a critical moment. Seriously, their navcoms crash so often it's like they're running Vista. But Blair saves the day when he enters a mystic trance and bashes out the mind-bogglingly complex calculations on the fly by typing them out by hand on the keypad. It's a pilgrim thing. Maniac spends most of the scene doing this. It's an imbecile thing. Yeah, and get used to the pilgrim shit because it's the one and only defining character trait Blair's given the entire movie. They embraced space, and for that they were rewarded with the gift of a flawless sense of direction. They could feel magnetic fields created by quasars and black holes. The black hole. Like a NAVCOM AI? Is the NAVCOM recreation of the mind of a single pilgrim. And why did the war start? They saw themselves as superior to men. They chose to abandon all things human. Some say they believed they were gods. It's just completely distracting and out of place. It has nothing to do with the games, and it introduces a bizarre mystic power in a setting that until now has managed to avoid psychics, Jedi, and supernatural bullshit. So now we're expected to believe that the original human colonists spontaneously developed a supernatural gift for sensing warp paths through gravitational fields. I mean, as supernatural gifts go, it's really kind of amazingly lame. 
These people thought they were gods because they could navigate starships without computers. What does God need with a starship? I mean, yeah, it's impressive, I guess, being able to navigate a starship without a computer. Although I think most starships have computers, so godlike? Buy a fucking calculator. <laughs> Worship me, rat brain, for I am a god! What? Oh, you are not. I am too, because you see, I have the innate ability to sense how high above sea level any place on the planet is. Well, couldn't you just check Wikipedia for that or something? Yes, but only a stupid man-animal would need to. I can do it all in my head. Bullshit, you can. Quiz me. Okay. Well, how high is uh, Mexico City above sea level? Feet or meters? Feet. 7,349. No, meters. 2,240. Whoa. Disneyland. Oh, please. 157 feet. Truly, you are the king of kings. Forgive me, Lord. I did not know. Blair and Maniac don't exactly find a warm welcome on the Tiger Claw because, well, Maniac. Blair immediately pisses everyone off by asking about a pilot named Bossman who died recently, not knowing that the pilots around here have a weird policy of claiming dead pilots never existed. He never existed. We're all going to die out here, but none of us need to be reminded of that fact. So you die, you never existed. Because that's a great way to honor the memories of your dead comrades. Bitterly deny their existence and start fights with anyone who says otherwise. You got a problem with my friend, Mr. Hunter? Yes, I do. Good, that means you got a problem with me. Is that so? Yeah. Oh, look out, guys. Matthew Lillard's got his back. I'm sure nobody wants a piece of that. You ladies don't stand down. You don't have a problem with me. All 70 pounds of me. Dear Lord, a bar fight with Matthew Lillard and Saffron Burroughs? This is going to be the whitest, boniest bar fight ever filmed. There's not 200 pounds between them. Actually, Maniac manages to make friends a little easier than Blair does. Not even Angel likes Blair, because the first thing he did when he got on board was piss her off by sitting in Bossman's old Starfighter. And Angel and Bossman were an item when he died. Although I'm not sure how he died, since his ship is still sitting fully intact on the flight deck, but whatever. The XO, played by Jurgen Prock now, is the typical angry dude who blames everything that goes wrong on Blair. He's a broken record about the Pilgrims being traitors, pretty much every scene he's saying the same thing. Pilgrims don't think like us. It's well documented that pilgrim saboteurs have been responsible for much of the Confed's problems in this war. Maybe he knew something we didn't. But I think he's just in a bad mood by being typecast in this DOS boat ripoff. But if you think I'm going to let my men be flown into combat by a rogue and a half-breed... Seems to me that Blair is not their biggest problem right now, since Maniac's one apparent mission in life is to be a danger to himself and others. He's like a four-year-old with ADD climbing on furniture while the ship is going to a dangerous warp through a fucking pulsar. Todd, Maniac Marshal, at your service, ma'am. And they let this Jagoff fly something with guns? I'm trying to be Mr. Sensitive Guy, it's just... Ugh. Oh, great ships, by the way. I'm sure the rivets make them real space-worthy. Maniac manages to... Oh, I'm sorry. I just threw up in my mouth a little. I never wanted to imagine Matthew Lillard nude and thrusting. Let's just say he manages to, like, uh, bond with the one other person on the ship as hopelessly stupid as he is. And they spend most of the B-plot engaged in an unbearably unfunny pissing contest to see who the biggest jackass in the galaxy truly is by seeing who can survive the most suicidal, full afterburn somersaulting crash landing on the runway. Shit! That maniac he is a card! Crashing expensive starships, indispensable to the war effort, destroying the flight deck and running over helpless technicians for fun! <laughs> he cracks me up! Man, watching Matthew Lillard try to act is like watching someone with no thumbs try to use chopsticks. Tom Wilson stole the show as Maniac in the video games, but even he couldn't have saved this movie. The script completely botches almost every character from the games. 
Angel's now English, when in the game she's French, or actually Belgian, that's why her name is Devereaux. Paladin is now Turkish, speaking French, when in the games he's Scottish. And Maniac is supposed to be the best pilot alive. He's supposed to be a lot like Maverick from Top Gun. Brash, cocky, arrogant, and anxious to prove that he's the best. He's dangerous, aggressive, out for himself, yes, but there's a difference between a guy who buzzes the tower for kicks and a guy who crashes into it. Well, it sounds like you memorized that speech. Good for you. Anyway, the Tiger Claw hides in a moon crater to escape detection by the enemy fleet, launching a decoy to draw their attention. They're following the decoy. They've missed us! Yeah! Yeah! There's a destroyer hunting us. Oh, sorry. They all have to stay very quiet or the destroyer will hear them. This is straight out of a submarine movie. You can tell Jurgen here is having serious U-boat flashbacks. You know, there's suspension of disbelief and then there's insulting my fucking intelligence. You don't need to be a scientist to figure out that ships wouldn't drop off the runway in outer space! Why should they be afraid that people outside the ship are going to hear them? Sound doesn't carry in a vacuum! They could have Slayer performing in the galley while shoving a cat in a garbage disposal, and nobody outside this ship would hear anything! Naturally, at this point in DOS Boat, the destroyer above them starts dropping depth charges, so the jig is up. They're nuking every crater. Bastards. The Tiger Claw launches fighters and attacks. Blair, despite being a fighter pilot, is sent along with a squad of marines to board the enemy destroyer. God forbid the hero of this movie actually commands any wings, you know. But the XO of the ship is going too, so hell if I know what's going on. He really is a good guy once you get to know him. Apparently the eight-foot-tall bipedal space tigers really like tight, cramped, difficult-to-navigate corridors, choked with smoke and flooded with dull green light. I would have expected more scratching posts, but whatever. Blair shoots some vague shadows I assume are supposed to be Kilrathi, and this is so ridiculously convenient I can't believe nobody brings this up. He finds the captured NAVCOM. Of all the ships in all the universe, it had to be right here, right now, on the one ship these guys tried to board. And even luckier, it's programmed with the exact entry coordinates for the Kilrathi invasion fleet. One wonders why, if there was such monumentally important navigational data on the computer, the Kilrathi didn't try to destroy it to prevent its capture. Or, like, you know, encrypt it? This new data could turn the tables on the entire war, although it never enters their mind that it could be a decoy. But they can't send a message to Admiral Tallwin because of all the damage they sustain in the attack. The only way to reach him in time is to send a starfighter. Impossible. There are over a thousand singularities in that quasar. To jump it would be suicide without NAVCOM coordinates. Damn, you're right! The only people who could possibly calculate a jump that crazy is one of those stupid scum-sucking pilgrims... Hey, wait a minute! You have the gift. Paladin gives Blair a heroic pep talk and says he has faith in him and reveals that he's a pilgrim too. So why doesn't Paladin go along if he has this mystic gift as well? I'd go with you, but uh, I'm really tired. Angel flies on Blair's wing to go deliver the message, but she gets diverted almost immediately when she detects a cloaking torpedo inbound to the carrier. Got it. A skipper missile. Dead on course for the Tiger Claw. One. How is it possible the graphics in this movie are worse than the video game? Well, she manages to destroy the torpedo just in the nick of time, but the explosion cripples her ship, and Blair is forced to abandon her with only an hour of air remaining to go complete the mission. But first she activates her distress beacon, and Blair radios her position back to the Tiger's Claw. Oh wait, they don't do that because this movie is fucking stupid! Blair engages his jump drive, but unbeknownst to him, a Kelrathi capital ship spies him leaving. <laughs> Oh, come on. Seriously? That's the Kilrathi? I've seen better animatronics at the fucking Country Bear Jamboree. They're completely hairless except for the goatees. They're hairless cats with goatees. You know, it looks like someone shaved the puppets from the video game. You based your whole movie off aliens that would have been laughed off the set of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Hell, it wouldn't have passed muster next to the carrot alien from It Conquered the World. She held together! I love this baby! Okay, I can't ignore this anymore. These costumes are god-awful. He looks like a ten-year-old kid in that dorky helmet. I'll try spinning. That's a good trick. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Tiger Claw is locked in a pitched space battle with another enemy destroyer, hoping to buy Blair just enough time to alert the rest of the fleet. Mr. Fuck, give me a target. 
<laughs> Did he just call that guy Mr. Fuck? Mr. Fuck, give me a target. Port side missile battery, prepare to fire. Now we've gone from submarine movie to pirate movie as Paladin actually orders a full broadside of cannons on the enemy destroyer. What, no astronauts swinging onto the deck of the other ship with grappling hooks? Once the battle's finished, Paladin announces that he's going off alone to look for Angel's escape pod. If I'm not back in two hours, make the jump to Earth. Blair makes it back to Earth and transmits his message, but has an entire battleship hot in his heels. But luckily, again, he manages to be within spitting distance of the enormous ship-devouring gravity well that almost killed him at the beginning of the movie. I wonder how nobody noticed the space anomaly with a gravitational pull several thousand times the power of our own sun in the middle of our solar system. That is not possible! No, really? This isn't the fleet? Why do we keep mistaking enormous star-sized glowing gaseous astral bodies for fleets of ships? I mean, is our radar completely worthless or what? What the hell is the matter with us? Come on! Why do people keep flying into this thing? Do these people have no concept of scale, distance, or time? And I'm talking about the assholes who wrote the script, not the Kilrathi. Look at the size of this thing! How do you accidentally fall into that? How does anyone mistake a black fucking hole for a fleet of battleships? I've seen more scientifically accurate episodes of Gilligan's Planet! Oh, blah 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 coordinates. Uh, David Warner blows up the bad guys, humanity is saved, and Matthew Lillard continues his quest to find an even dumber video game movie script. The Tiger Claw arrives, and Blair gets word that Paladin just managed to return in time with Angel, and he's calling for a medical crew. He should be calling for a coroner since he told the Tiger Claw to depart in two hours, and Angel only had an hour of air remaining, so by my math she was breathing vacuum for a little over 60 minutes. Oh wait, she's fine, never mind. Oh, come on! The only way she could possibly be dead or is if she were holding her breath to appear in a sequel to this space turd. If Super Mario Bros. was the first nail in the coffin of movies based on video games, then Wing Commander was the last. Because, believe me, nobody ever took video game movies seriously after this complete and utter ruination of gaming's best original sci-fi saga. They should have just saved themselves a heap of trouble and put some kid's let's play of Wing Commander 4 in theaters. Would have made a lot more money. Johannesburg, South Africa. 5,751 feet. Scientology is the one true religion! than Jesus.